Sound check! I am a two-time VHSL state champion forensicator. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's talk about sex. <laughs> I love delivering that line, half of you look totally terrified, and the other half completely enthralled. What did you think about when I said we'd be discussing sex today? Love. Ecstasy. The creation of life. What about STDs? A plague. What about death? As a society, we have been exposed to more dialogue about the expression of sexuality through action than we've been exposed to dialogue about the concept of sexuality itself. It is no secret that the world in which we live stigmatizes homosexual individuals for exactly that reason. The very nature of the way we perceive how they express love is based on misconceptions. One of the largest and most problematic misconceptions that I am aware of is the idea of the gay plague resulting from the promiscuity of gay culture. I'm talking about HIV and AIDS, more specifically, long-term survivors of the AIDS epidemic. Long-term survivors are those individuals who are diagnosed as being HIV positive in the early to mid-1980s. They are soldiers who were drafted against their will to fight in a war that 35 years later is still not over and won't be until there is a cure for AIDS. This subgroup of afflicted individuals is constantly overlooked. No one wants to think about long-term survivors, where they come from, the lifestyle they lead, or who they are. These individuals are left behind simply because they had the audacity to think they had the right to live their life in an authentic manner while on their pursuit of happiness. Let's be clear. Human immunodeficiency virus and acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which attack the blood cells and compromises the immune system, is the result of a malignant virus entering the human body through contact with blood, semen, vaginal, or other bodily fluids. The virus is believed to have first appeared in the United States in the mid to late 1970s. However, the first reported cases were not diagnosed until June of 1981. In the days following the report of the first five cases in Los Angeles, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was flooded with reports of similar cases from doctors all across the country. By the end of the year, just a few months later, there were 270 reported cases of severe immune deficiency, what would later be called AIDS, in gay men, and 121 of them had died. In its earliest stages, HIV appeared to only affect homosexual individuals. The first reported case of AIDS resulting from a blood transfusion did not come until December of 1982. 18 months after the first reported case of AIDS had been diagnosed, when newborn infants were diagnosed with opportunistic infections. The first reported case of AIDS in a female resulting from heterosexual contact did not come until January of 1983, proving that women, as well as men, could be infected with the virus. According to the World Health Organization, as of today, there are 39.9 million individuals living worldwide with HIV and AIDS, an estimated 2.6 million of which are children. Since the first reported case of AIDS in 1984, an estimated 34 million individuals have died due to AIDS-related causes. In 1988, Professor Harry Pangier released a study titled AIDS, Survival Analyses of Persons Testing HIV Positive, stating that from the time of infection, life expectancy was believed to range from 3 to 24 months. As of today, with the evolution of the virus and the development of antiretroviral therapy, life expectancy is believed to be 40 years with treatment and 13 years without. Now, while the diagnosis of AIDS is still a death sentence, it is not a cause of death. AIDS is the final stage of HIV. This is when the CD4 cell count in the human body drops below 200 or when one or more opportunistic infections are diagnosed. These AIDS-defining illnesses are what will eventually lead to death. They include various types of cancer, pneumonia, fungal and bacterial infections, parasitic diseases, and wasting. There is, however, one AIDS-defining illness that seems to be constantly overlooked, AIDS Survivor Syndrome. According to the organization Let's Kick Ass, AIDS Survivor Syndrome is defined as being a combination of depression, emotional numbness, survivor guilt, insomnia, substance abuse, and sexual risk-taking, all stemming from post-traumatic stress. Dr. William Niederland coined the term Survivor Syndrome 16 years after the the Holocaust to describe the trauma that those who had gone through death camps were experiencing. And we have now reached that point in the AIDS epidemic. After all, how does one appropriately respond to living after preparing and expecting to die every single day 
for the past three decades. I'd like to share with you a story that my good friend Ken told me. New York, 1984. In the middle of autumn, his best friend Paul catches a cold. He finally goes to the doctor a few weeks later to get a vitamin B shot or something, but he is immediately admitted to the hospital. Over the next couple of weeks, Ken learned a few things. He learned the definition and speed of wasting. He learned what the pink placard unceremoniously plastered onto a hospital room door meant, which ultimately, depending on who was working that shift, Paul's food tray would be left in the hall by the door. He learned that when Paul said he did not think he could make it to the bathroom, he was not being dramatic because he was sitting in his own shit. He learned not to hug Paul when he cried because he thought that Ken might catch it from his tears. He learned that lesions caused by Kaposi's sarcoma could develop on the body in the time it took to get something out of a vending machine, and the one on the tip of his nose really hurt. He learned how to put on a full-body protective suit and that it was, in fact, optional, so screw you. He learned what PCP is, pneumocystis pneumonia, and that it meant the end. One of the most important lessons that Ken learned in those two weeks is that those you most cherish can and do disappear in front of your eyes like time-lapse photography. Because a cold today is a funeral in two weeks. What a traumatization, am I right? I wish. During the height of the epidemic in New York, it was not at all uncommon to be in a funeral home three or four times a week. They were dying and no one was doing a thing because it's just the faggots, so who cares? They were not expendable. Today's activists are focused on transgender issues and pre-exposure prophylaxis, better known as PrEP. Now, I believe that these are issues worth fighting for, but who is fighting for the long-term survivors? Their bodies are ravaged and breaking down quicker than they should. Each and every one of them has health issues relating to their younger years, learning the long-term effects of the cocktail of medications that they took, and they are becoming too tired to keep fighting. But without them, their contributions, their history, their willingness to donate their bodies and in some cases their lives to clinical trials and failures, there would have been no one to fight for the advances made against this monster of a virus that lives within so many people tormenting them. These individuals who have endured HIV, AIDS, PCP, hepatitis B and C, HPV, radiation, chemotherapy, months of their lives confined to a hospital bed, and so many more horrors that even in your wildest of dreams do not begin to come close to their abhorrent realities. Long-term survivors are living living on borrowed time, and the only way that their debt can possibly be repaid is to find a cure for AIDS. We owe every single advancement that has been made in the fight against HIV and AIDS to those that have come before us, and it is time that we repay their debt and honor our AIDS veterans. Our journey with AIDS is not over, so listen here, soldiers. Our predecessors have done their duty bravely and far beyond what we could have ever asked, but people are still dying from AIDS. Based on estimates from the World Health Organization, since I started speaking, 23 individuals have died from AIDS-related causes. Stand up, fight back, fight AIDS. Do it for those that have fought and do it for those that are fighting because until there's a cure, we are all just long-term survivors. What you've just watched is my 2016 VHSL 2A state championship winning original oratory long-term survivors and the AIDS epidemic. I had no intention of competing this year until I realized that I had the unique opportunity to be able to tell the story of long-term survivors, a group that is constantly overlooked yet desperately in need of our help. To say that I am overwhelmed by the success of this piece is an understatement. It is a humbling experience to be recognized in this way for something that I feel so passionate about. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a long-term survivor. If you would like to help, I'm going to put the links for Gay Men's Health Crisis and my favorite charity, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, in the down bar. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, click like and hit subscribe. I'll see you soon.